This is where did the road go. Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? Welcome to this week's show. And this week I have something. There, there are certain topics I really uh, really enjoy. I think anyone who listens to this show knows what they are. And, I, and I'm really a fan of Fortean stuff, um, deep UFO stuff, and uh, anything that has to do with uh, sort of the whole fairy faith and such like that. And tonight's guest, Joshua Cutchin, is uh, perfect for that. Are you with us, Josh? Yes, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, technically, you were here last week as well. Yep. For a completely different subject, as we explored the subject of evidence and the paranormal. Yeah, that was a really good time. We we, we went far afield, but I think we earned it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and we are uh, we are planning on following that up because I want to take it uh, in a slightly different direction as well. Uh, and there was a lot of stuff we didn't get to. We didn't get to cover uh, ghost hunting and things like that, and what EVPs may represent. Um, and also, I kind of want to take it in the the direction of. Uh, mainstream science yeah i think that there's a lot of uh, of rich material that we that we barely scratch the surface yeah. of so I've, I've been actually thinking about that this past week as well quite a bit so so uh we will be doing there's a midweek podcast sometime in the near future and who will be doing it with us we're not 100 percent sure we'll find out when we do it um but yeah it, it occurred to me that we were focusing on the paranormal where mainstream science often will throw out things as facts that they have no evidence for for instance uh dark matter yeah, I mean it's 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 this uh, this. Sometimes I feel like well, <laughs> I can see us going off into this direction as well in <laughs> this podcast. But sometimes I, I feel like we sort of uh, t take uh, science tends to take a stance and work backwards from that. And sometimes yeah. you know, sometimes I don't think that's always the most appropriate stance. You know. So uh, we will, we will be doing that in the near future. Uh, but tonight we're going to be talking about your first book, A Trojan Feast: The Food and Drink Offerings of Aliens, Fairies, and Sasquatch. And yes, yes, first, first ever. So and this is out on Anomalous Books, who publish all kinds of awesome stuff. They just uh, republished a bunch of Jacques Vallée stuff, and I think some of John Keel's stuff as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah, and Patrick Huige is the uh, is the uh, major domo there, so to speak, and he he does a great job and is a, is a real prince of a human being. So it's been a pleasure to work with him, and I really really do appreciate him uh, having the faith in this project from from the very beginning. So. I was fascinated when I first heard you on the, the Grailian Report when you were initially talking about this and still collecting data. And honestly, this is one of the best books I've read in a while. I, I had a hard time putting it down. Well, I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, the Grailian Report, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, the great hand that Micah Hanks has had in, in pushing me forward down this path. Um, he really had a lot of faith in the project also when it was in its very, vest, you know, very, very germinal stages. Yeah. Um, but this is this is a topic that's been sort of uh you know dancing through my brain for a while because it's it's been one of those things that I I just knew that no one had really ever taken a nice hard look at in the way that I wanted to take a look at it and uh I I am I'm quite pleased with the with the final result and and it seems a lot you know I mean it's not when you say food and drink especially when you refer to the fairy faith that was a common element um and even in, in alien abduction, you get it a little bit. And Sasquatch, I was a little little off on, you know. Like I'm like, there's there's food and drink offerings in Sasquatch, but you you point out in the book, there's not a ton of it, but there are similarities here and there with it. Right. The, the main reason, and I, you know, I've I've uh, I've been thinking about this a lot ever since it's come out. Uh, the main reason that I I sort of lumped Sasquatch in there is because. Uh, it's actually the same reason that really prompted me to go ahead and write this book. Um, in a lot of, uh, I'm sure everyone listening is familiar with the old uh, fairy food taboo, where if you uh, were given food or drink by the fairies, then you would be trapped in fairyland forever. And I always found this really fascinating um, in terms of greater uh, Fortiana, in terms of um, 
uh, people who have been claimed to be abducted by aliens and have received liquids or food or drink, which is actually rather common, more common than I think anyone really expects. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, I, I found this this commonality between that and some First Nations lore in North America that said that if you took food from Sasquatch, you would be trapped with the Sasquatch forever. So that's really the reason that that Sasquatch. Um, was sort of involved in this project to begin with. Uh, I sort of tried to let the data push me in certain directions. Um, I'm really on the fence about the nature of Sasquatch being flesh and blood or a, a, a spirit creature or or nothing at all. Um, well, I think but, it, I, I I would think at this point we have to say it's people are seeing something. There's too much, you know, too, oh, too many yeah. sightings. So I, I don't I don't know that it can be qualified as nothing at all. Well, I, I guess I mean nothing at all. Sort of in in the. Uh, more in the in the lines of these these sort of liminal entities that I end up uh, mm. thinking about towards the end of the book. Okay. This sort of like this sort of in between, right. objective, subjective. You know, so, something something that doesn't fall into the flesh and blood or purely like spirit creature uh, camps. But uh, I tried to try to take a look at this as, as much as I could from a from a from a you know a completely objective standpoint and see where the data sort of pushed me because there are certain tendencies that I have and I tried to keep myself as removed as I could uh, from making any conclusions until I had you know gathered the data. Uh, all to myself, and which is the reason that there isn't a single first-person chapter until the very end, because I want to make <laughs> it very clear <laughs> that this is what I think, and you know, yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah and, and versus the stuff that is objectively out there. So, hmm. yeah, uh, Patrick Harper actually recently said to me that he feels that Sasquatch is likely just a big hairy daemon, just like uh, you know the fairies and aliens are daemons. Uh, He's <laughs> just a big hairy one at that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th there there are a lot of uh, striking similarities between fairies and Sasquatch, and and that's really uh, when you get really down to it. My personal interests, that's where my interests really lie, is is in how this phenomena, these all these phenomena, tend to connect themselves to each other in really interesting ways. Um, uh, my next project that I'm working on, uh, it's a, <laughs> it's it's a little bit bigger than this one, so it's a little bit more intimidating. But it's another av aspect of this where, uh, just taking a look at these similarities, and I think if we take a look at these similarities between phenomena, that might really be where we can get some make some headway. You know, I don't necessarily yeah. think that. You know, I, I admire the guys who um, are measuring burn marks in the ground, as Mike Cleland says often. Um, but uh, I, that's not really where I think we're going to have any new revelations because the phenomena is always going to outwit us. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and and you, I think your conclusion in here is that uh, is is in line with people like Jacques Vallée and stuff that feel like what we're seeing is a uh, is a mask that is changing as culture changes. Yeah, it's it's a lot of a lot of uh, theater involved. I mean, I, I think that if one is if one is completely honest, one has to admit that at the very least, the phenomena, especially in the case of UFOs, um, is completely in control of these experiences sure. and and is uh, very ready to capitalize on cultural norms and to recontextualize itself throughout time. So let, let, let's get into a little of the meat of this. And uh, sure. For anyone who's not aware, do you want to explain what you mean by fairy faith in here? Or fairies? I'm Oh sure, sure. Um, well, you know, we we tend to think of fairies as being the sanitized, Disney-fied characters that we we often see in popular culture. These tiny sprites with wings who grant wishes and whatnot. Um, but uh, in reality, the fairies, the fae folk of uh, the British Isles, and actually a lot of other cultures around the globe had similar beliefs. Um, were quite sinister. They were earth elementals that had uh, certain powers over. Uh, over the environment, and uh, they were one of the most feared things uh, in 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 primitive society. Uh, you would never ever want to uh, cross a fairy or make them upset. You would want to leave out offerings for them, often food, most often food. Um, to leave out the wrong offerings or to uh, <clears throat> To forget to leave out the offerings meant uh, that at the very least you wouldn't receive the benefits of having a fairy on your side, and at the very worst meant that a fairy would be uh, would have a bone to pick with you and would actually make your life a lot harder. So, it's uh, it's it, fairies have actually been a big a big uh, point of interest for me uh, for quite a long time. In, in large part due to the way that they tend to cross over with uh, with the UFO phenomena. And as we sort of alluded to earlier, uh, the you know Bigfoot and Sasquatch phenomena is not uh, 
is not outside of that category entirely either. There are a lot of similarities. Now, of course, to be very clear, I'm still on the fence about the, the nature of a lot of this phenomena. I don't think that Bigfoot is a fairy or that fairies are Bigfoot or aliens are fairies or fairies are aliens. I'm not entirely sure that these aren't completely discrete phenomena using similar methods, but when you really dig down to the bedrock, there are a lot of similar things that, that happen. You know, There are a lot of centers to these Venn diagrams that overlap. Okay, all right. And, I mean, the... The the thing is, you got. Uh, I think I think it was Jacques Vallée who initially pointed out the whole fairy alien connection. Although there were people prior to that who who mentioned it, and uh, John Keel, of course, was kind of going along the same lines around the same time. And the connection there is, I mean, there are so many similarities, but there's way more food involved in the fairy encounters. There is, um, you know, it, that was one of the big things that you know I, I alluded to earlier is that is that if you were to ever meet a fairy along uh, a darkened road, or if you were to ever be invited uh, into a fairy mound where they're having a party, you should not eat or drink. Usually, in these stories, people would be invited to a fairy party, and the fairies who have long had this association with the dead um, would often have some uh, dead dead uh, neighbors of the person who was invited into the fairy mound at the party. And these dead neighbors were usually the ones who would warn people, do not uh, eat or drink of their food, lest you stay here forever. Um, so that that's that's the main thing, that, the main motif that you see recurring time and again in, and, in a lot of this lore. And, and when you talk about that too, I mean, Whitley Strieber, his last book, was talking a lot about how the dead figure into alien abduction encounters. Like people will see their dead relatives. Whitley saw a dead friend who he didn't know was dead in his initial encounter. So, I mean, even that, there's some connections there as well. Even It's like the archetype is the same, but the phenomena is completely different in a way. Right, and that's that's my main problem with things like biological Bigfoot theory or extraterrestrial hypothesis, or even, to be honest, the, 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 the spirit being Bigfoot theory. These are all very, very tidy theories for some very, very grossly untidy phenomena. <laughs> um, you know, you just you cannot pigeonhole that at all. Um, and there are all these... I, I, some Something... You know, if we ever if we ever are able to unravel these mysteries, we're going to find that there's some sort of connection with consciousness. I can say that, and I think that there's yeah. some sort of connection within that to uh, to uh, the dead. Now, whether that means uh, our memories of the dead and our consciousness somehow manifesting themselves, or actually means the uh, disincarnate spirits spirits of the dead, I'm not sure. But I, I think that there's something it's somehow somehow tied up in this. I'm not really sure, and I don't certainly don't go into that in the book. But uh, no, no, but, you don't. But 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 I but I think that there's something there. There's definitely something there. I, I I love in the book that you'll you'll start telling a story and you don't identify at first whether it's fairy faith or UFO lore, and you're reading it and you're going. <laughs> I have no idea which one. Oh, that happened in 1990 and was a UFO encounter. All right. <laughs> yeah, I, it's really it's really funny. You know, some of these, especially uh, outside of America, you know, in America we've, we've uh, whether or not it's objectively true, we see uh, large-headed gray aliens nowadays. And right. you go to a lot of other countries, like in South America, there are all these hairy dwarves that could have literally just stepped right out of some of this older folklore. And, and some of the stories, I, I mean, I love reading some of these stories. I read... Uh, the book you quote from a lot, uh, Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, yes. years and years ago. And some of these stories, I mean, they're just so fascinating because they're, they're easy to dismiss as fantasy. But when you realize these are being reported over and over from different people or in a whole different area who don't know one another yet, they're so similar. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing because I think anybody who's involved in this starts to have their – uh, their faith in whether or not they're chasing wild geese uh, tends to waver from time to time, and and it's those connections, those those really fascinating similarities between people of different socioeconomic strata, people of different people of different countries, people of different cultures, um, that really reinforces the fact that there's something going on here. Now, you know, at the end of the day, it might be a it might be not as objective as we'd like for it to be, but I, you know, I, I think those similarities really do reinforce the fact that we're not really wasting our time. Yes, yeah, I agree. Um, now, w one of the things that you see in fairy faith, you don't see so much in UFO literature and such, is the aging from eating the food. When when people eat food in fairyland, they come back and they age, and in some cases, turn to dust. Right, right. Yeah, I am um, actually have have. Uh, have have thought about that a good deal because uh, a lot of times people will not uh, 
turn into dust after returning from the fairy realm until they eat an earthly meal, which mm. I think is which I think is an interesting uh, component. Um, but yeah, you don't really you don't really see that a lot. It's not a direct parallel uh, like it like it used to be. Uh, sometimes I wonder, you know. Similarly, I mean, you don't have people who uh, take food from aliens and abduction lore and stay with the aliens forever. Or if you do, you never hear about it because well, yeah, you know, that's the problem. We speak. Um, but but you have plenty of people who do take something in these scenarios and and do return. So sometimes I think if the, these motifs of never returning or crumbling into dust aren't somehow more metaphorical, and right. that might sound like I'm being an apologist and doing exactly what I criticize science of, working backwards from <laughs> from, from established points. I'm completely aware of that possible uh, fallacy in my logic. But uh, you know, I think that I think that uh, in the case of being trapped forever, I think it says something about you know being forever. I mean, you look at these people who, who do have abduction experiences today, and are often written off as being crazy, sure. um, or even seeing. So I, I, th I think that, that that you know the idea that you can't return home, you can't return to the way that things once were after you've had this experience, might be a little bit where mm. more where the truth lies as opposed to a literal, you know, physical imprisonment in in the in the realm of the other. At the same time, though, there are a huge amount of missing people just in this country alone. And when I had Artie Six Killer on, she was telling stories from people down in the in the you know Mayans and uh, mm -hmm. different cultures down there, and a number of cases that she found where people left and never came back. Yeah, and I and I think that uh, I think that that's not inconsequential at all. Um, you know, I, I've I've mentioned inevitably. It feels like every time I speak with someone, the work of David Politis comes up. Right. Um, and I, I I think that. I've said this on Facebook and, and Twitter a couple of times. I think that his work is probably the most important, with a capital I, of any uh, 14 work because it really is directly impacting a lot of people's lives. And um, I agree. I think that, uh, and there's a Kickstarter right now, so go check it out, folks, for a, for a missing 411 documentary. Uh, I'm not involved in it at all, but I really want to see this thing take off. Yeah, and that, that um, David is behind that. Yes, mm -hmm, yeah. Um, but uh, you know, it's. It's it's interesting. I think that I don't think that the lion's share of cases like that are just prosaic explanations of serial killers or people wandering into the wilderness and getting lost. I think that there really is something uh, high strange to a lot of these these different things. And it's interesting, you know, some people have pointed out some similarities between David's work and my work because yes. a lot of times these children um, will be found, you know, after well, the scenario in his work is that. People go out to look for these missing children in national parks and whatnot, and they'll often walk back by and the, a place where they've been searching, and they'll suddenly find the child. But what's interesting is a lot of these children will, will be going out to pick berries in a lot of these scenarios, yes. and it's something that David's pointed out as well. So, um, you know, when I first started out on this project, uh, you, you know, there are so many different ways that you could you could have gone with this. Just food in general. What does Bigfoot eat? What do aliens eat? Are they eating people? This sort of thing. <laughs> right. But like. But but the similarity that I really noticed was the the prevalence of offerings, um, and uh, you know it's, this this isn't being done in most cases for sustenance. Most of these encounters are relatively short. It has to be it, the implication is that these entities are giving people food to produce some sort of an effect. But uh, I really had to focus on the offerings of these entities as a, an initial way to get my arms around this giant data set. And I would love to you know going forward. Uh, speak with or work with or just use some of the work of uh, David uh, Pilatus uh, and, and because I think that there is there is some sort of connection there. So my next project isn't going to be focusing on that, but I, I, I'm definitely going to return to this food motif because it's there's still a bunch of rich stuff that to, that, to draw on there. Hmm. The uh, Yeah, I mean, I was going to mention the berry thing, but the other, the other connection with the 411 stuff is uh, you're talking about uh, the fairies and stuff, how they live in thickets and broom sage as well as rock crags. And you look at where people end up missing from, and it's, you know, boulder fields, and they get found in thicket bushes, and, you know, and it's like there's just, there, is so, there are so many connections between the 411 stuff and folklore mm -hmm. that it's hard to ignore. Yes, it's, it's really striking, I believe, and, and someone... Yeah, well, there's probably going to yell at me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but I believe that uh, he mentioned uh, being in on, on Hawaii and speaking with a cab driver or something who yes. used to say that uh, was it, was this on your show? He used uh, to say that um, yeah, used to say so. that the Minahune, the, the the fairy folk of Hawaii, the the way to 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 
supplicate them whenever they walked by was to take off your clothes and bury your face in the sand, yep. which is the way a lot of these people are found. Yep, that's yeah. in his latest book too. Yeah. So, um, so I, yeah, it's 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 amazing the way that it that it connects. One of the things that I I thought of is there's a, a girl use this anecdote in my book. Um, there was this girl who was in uh, Iceland, who was playing amongst some boulders and. She actually uh, fell down, and from one of these boulders emerged this little this little man, and uh, or this little this little fairy being, who invited her into the boulder, which is <laughs> something that we have to you know it's hard to wrap your head around. But uh, they actually gave her a uh, quote unquote spiral shaped cake and some funny banana juice, um, which uh, which I thought was a charming little anecdote. But yeah, you know, a lot of those people in those cases uh, disappear around around boulders. Um, and this particular case from Iceland is really indicative of a lot of the themes that I found of, of um, a lot of the trims. You know, it's funny when I actually uh, saw that documentary that this anecdote ap- appeared in, I, I was able to sort of predict what she was going to be given. You know, I, was, I knew that she wasn't going to be given a steak. And I, and I knew that she wasn't going to be giving you know, a fillet of fish. Uh, you know, I was able to say, well, let's see, a fairy. What do they what do they tend to give? Well, uh, if they give a food, it's going to be a grain. And if they give a drink, it's either going to be an ale or a wine or a juice drink. And, and you know, right, right before she said that, I was able to. So that's that's nice. that's that, that's that's when I knew that I was really onto something. Is when <laughs> when when my when the trends that I was seeing started to become predictive. Um, and you know you, you will find some of those other foods that I mentioned not appearing uh, are occasionally offered from time to time in these encounters. But for the most part, uh, there's a pretty narrow list of of things that are are given and given and received. Okay, and let, let's talk a little bit about that. One of the things you noted is it's very similar to what's called the Satvik diet. Yes, yeah. Um, this was something that I completely stumbled upon uh, uh, by accident. I really. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've never really been big into uh, Eastern philosophy, at least in, 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 in terms of in terms of a diet. I'm a big guy. I like to eat everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it's the, the idea of the Satvic diet will probably be more familiar to people who are familiar with other tr- other cultures that talk about uh, hot foods and cold foods, foods that can actually change um, actually change your disposition. Um, uh, in, in this case. Uh, Certain foods in Ayurvedic tradition are said to have certain effects: uh, tamasic, rajasic, and uh, sattvic. And I'm probably butchering some pronunciations, but that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. Um, tamasic foods uh, tend to make people uh, pessimistic or, or lazy, um, and their their health tends to suffer. Tamasic foods are really easy to to list. Um, there's some variance between different disciplines, but uh, but for the most part, tamasic foods are are you know. Uh, pork, beef, meats, um, drugs and alcohol, uh, junk food, canned food, decaying food, stuff like that. And then you'll find people uh, who say that there are these. There's another. There's another uh, subset called rajasic foods, which are foods that tend to uh, give you passion and give you. You know, they tend to stir up the emotions. And those foods are. This is where the most leeway is in different Ayurvedic traditions. Um, but uh, those tend to be like garlic. Spicy foods, foods that tend to sort of uh, increase your 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 energy, and the best foods in Ayurvedic tradition that you're supposed to eat are called sattvic foods, and those tend to be sweet fruits, dairy products, um, grains, vegetables, etc. And <laughs> lo and behold, if you look at a lot of the foods uh, received from people who hang out with, in particular, fairies and aliens. Aliens, not necessarily meaning uh, that we're adopting the extraterrestrial hypothesis, but just what we refer to as aliens in popular right, culture. Right. Um, they tend to be given sattvic foods. Now, the reason that this is really interesting is that you know, in Ayurvedic philosophy, uh, people who partake of a of a sattvic diet not only tend to live a better life, but it's also the diet that holy men and clairvoyants are supposed to use. So. Anyone who is, I'm sure anyone who is who is listening to your show is sort of aware of the connections that aren't necessarily apparent at first between uh, clairvoyance and consciousness and and the alien abduction experience, um, and also in terms of clairvoyance and 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 the, the fairy you know, the fairy faith. A lot of people who could commune with the fairies would actually go into a trance and say that they were then in the fairy realm. So. It's this tightly uh, woven ball of of fortiana and consciousness. But uh, even more interesting to me is that. There's been some people who uh, have actually been abducted by aliens and come back and adopted a diet that is more or less sattvic. Um, <clears throat> Elaine Avis uh, was an abductee. 
uh, from, I believe, the 1970s in England. And when they came back uh, from their abduction experience, they completely gave up alcohol, tobacco, uh, preservatives, any sort of food colorings, anything bizarre, and meat as well. So they would definitely fall under that satvic category. Huh. All right. And that's, that, that's such a weird connection because it takes something that many people would ascribe to being completely, you know, imaginary in a sense. And it shows that, hey, here's something spiritual, a spiritual path that actually fits that same sort of thing. So do we know where that diet came from? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, a natural outgrowth of a lot of the, uh, the ancient uh, scholars who, who have studied the ancient Vedic texts. Um, it, it's also, you know, sort of a natural progression from uh, Hindu beliefs in the way that they revere uh, the cow. Um, you know, you certainly, you, you don't want to eat cows in India, and, uh, you know, milk is considered a holy substance, and there seems to be an obsession with a lot of these entities with milk, fairies, aliens, and Sasquatch. Um, milk was one of the most common uh, fairy offerings, and uh, a lot of times uh, cows who are around UFOs give less milk the next day, and, uh, a lot of uh, there's there have been plenty of Sasquatch encounters that, inc that either include the the theft of milk or the uh, the direct suckling of milk from cows. <laughs> so, um, so it's 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 interesting. You know, I think that uh, I think that there's also some research to indicate a scientific basis for this. I mean, you look at this, what I basically described was a a restrictive lacto vegetarian diet, um, and the reason that this isn't just a lacto vegetarian diet and uh, in general is because the foods that I noticed in my survey of the most common foods given are the foods most emphasized in uh, sat in the sattvic diet. So while while a, 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 your generic lacto-vegetarian diet will include you know uh, fruit drinks or fruit juices, they are one of the most important uh, drinks in uh, beverages, foods in the sattvic diet, and they are one of the most prevalent things that people ex uh, describe being given aboard aboard craft and, and by ferries and whatnot. So that's, that's really where the comparison comes in. But there is a scientific basis for this. There have been some studies that have shown that people actually are in a more uh, psychological balanced state when they, can, when they consume this sort of a diet. Hmm. And, I, and I think for anyone who, you know, looks at these phenomena and says there's nothing to it, when you look at this, this, this aspect of it, there's no reason that if people are just making this stuff up or having hallucinations or whatever, that any of this stuff should match up. And yet it matches up over data that goes back centuries. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I, um, one of the things that I point to is sort of my, my favorite connection in the book is, I'm sure we'll probably talk about this at some point, but I'll go ahead and jump to it. The famous Joe Simonton case. Right. Which is sort of the poster child for this entire aspect of the phenomena. Joe Simonton was a chicken farmer from Eagle River, Wisconsin. Uh, anyone listening in Wisconsin, say hello to the great state of Wisconsin for me. I went there in my undergrad, and it's one of my favorite places in the planet. But uh, <laughs> but uh, Joe was 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 cooking breakfast one morning, and he heard this sound that sounded like radials on wet pavement. And he looks outside, and there's this shiny, giant, shiny uh, chrome craft that looks like an upturned bowl. And uh, there's this little being who's having hoists this jug aloft and is waving, and appears to be asking for water. So Joe goes inside, fills up the jug, and uh, returns. And he notices that one of the other guys, uh, one of the other, he calls them guys. He called them. He said that they looked like Italians. Um, <laughs> was uh, was actually cooking on some sort of quote unquote flameless griddle that looked like wrought iron. And what he was making were uh, what people would describe. Uh, variously as either cookies or pancakes, um, and they gave him several of these. Uh, some one of which wound up with J. Allen Hynek, one of them which wound up in the Air Force, one of them wound up with a local judge. Um, I heard a rumor uh, that there's actually one of these in a museum at Wright Patterson now. I'm not sure yeah. if that's the case at all. Um, but uh, and he also kept one for himself. He said they tasted awful. Um, but, uh, but, and they were, they were, they were examined to have completely mundane earthly ingredients. Um, but the reason that I brought up this to begin with is that we are talking about how people know the, how people sort of, if, if this is not an objective phenomenon in some way, how would people know these things? Well, here's what I want to know. How would Simonton have had any knowledge that there are a race of fairies purported to be in the Friesen Islands, uh, around Germany and Denmark? Um, known as the Unerbanski, and these Unerbanski would help farmers in the fields by bringing them pancakes 
and uh, and, and 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 water. So <laughs> it's just a nice little, you know. It's 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 not what if someone were to make that up. I don't, you know, I, I right, don't think right. that they would have gone with nasty bland pancakes. And and that's the other thing. I mean, if he said, well, they gave me pancakes, but I ate them all, and I don't have them for you to research. The fact that he gave them to people. Yeah, and he was pretty much unimpeccable as far as like his uh, reputation and uh, the people who would vouch for him as well. He wasn't the type to just make things up. Yeah, he seemed to be just a very. I mean, like a lot of these, a lot of folks who who experience these things, he probably suffered more grief from it than anything. Um, but uh, you know, and and I think the official explanation that they came down with was, oh well, he. It was daydreaming, and he cooked the pancakes himself, or something absurd <laughs> like that. Something absurd like that. Um, yeah, I, 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 I it, it's one of the most peculiar cases because it's just so uh, left field, you know. Yeah. And it's notable because there was something left over. But again, like like this phenomena always tends to do, there is nothing nothing to be shown for it in right. terms of in terms of an answer. Capital A. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Now, one of the things you talk about, which I've always found interesting, is the foison or food energy that uh, fairies and such are supposed to be able to suck away from things. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, to someone who is, because I, I really do think that I'm, I'm skeptical in the positive term, uh, the true skeptics that you mentioned in the in the in the bumper to the beginning of the show, um, and I have to look at this idea of foison. Uh, as as sort of a convenient way to explain why uh, fairy offerings aren't always gone in the morning. Basically what foison is, is it's what uh, fairies truly subsided on. So uh, <clears throat> whenever you would leave food out for a fairy, let's say you were to leave some milk out for a pixie, they wouldn't come and actually physically drink the milk. They would actually extract uh, foison from, from the milk, uh, the energy, the essence. Uh, there's another Welsh term that I, I'm not going to try to pronounce uh, <laughs> for, 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 for this food energy, this food essence. But uh, they would extract it. And then once, once the essence was extracted from the food, it was worthless. And th there are plenty of uh, examples of dogs and cats um, who have eaten either the leftover offerings or drunk the leftover milk and have become sick. Uh, a nice little parallel with a lot of uh, livestock mutilation that you see now where animals, yeah. uh, predators tend to avoid mutilated corpses. Um, but uh, so it, it does seem like there's this idea of, well, you know, uh, foison is, is just this convenient way of writing off how the phenomena doesn't act the way you want it to. But, but we have to look at this and say, well, hold on. Uh, those pancakes that Joe Simonton got tasted awful and didn't have any taste and were bland, you know? Um, similarly, whenever people uh, w were given food by fairies, uh, it was actually cloaked with this aura of glamour, which would make it look delicious. And every time uh, in a lot of literature, uh, it's revealed that this food that they're given is not really uh, – is not really a food at all, but is actually detritus. It's leaves and twigs and worms, and uh, even in one Finnish tale, it was a, 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 a cup full of frogs and worms instead of a tankard of ale. Hmm. So I mean, there's this idea of something being given that isn't what it seems, which also lines up with the, with the Simonton tale quite well. True, true. Um, let's get into Sasquatch for a moment. Now, what kind of food does Sasquatch tend to give people? Yeah, Sasquatch was the uh, was the wrench in the works of my, <laughs> of my entire plan because you see a lot of these similarities between fairies and and aliens in terms of uh, contemporary accounts, and you don't see that in Sasquatch. There are there are some interesting parallels uh, between the legends of what Sasquatch would give, um, or uh, the way that Sasquatch would give you food. But in terms of modern contemporary accounts, where people say that they are taken by Sasquatch. Um, there's not a lot of overlap there. Sasquatch tend to give things that you would expect a large uh, bipedal biological ape would give. So um, they're the only entities in this that give meat on even a moderately consistent basis. <clears throat> um, although more prevalent than meat often is uh, roots and tubers and things of that nature, never any liquids. One would presume that's because Sasquatch doesn't exactly keep, uh, you know, a, a beer stein hanging around. <laughs> Um, sure. Yeah, uh, but uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, it, so so Sasquatch tends to tends to give things that one would expect, and a lot of those cases are longer term when people are abducted by Sasquatch or claim to be abducted by Sasquatch. So that really does imply that there is more of a uh, more of a uh, 
caretaking motive behind them actually giving their uh, their abductees some sort of food. Um, all those cases, not unlike alien abduction, a lot of them tend to be uh, focused around procreation, around hybridization. Uh, there was a, a famous case of a young lady named uh, Seraphine Long, uh, who <coughs> who was uh, actually abducted and had some uh, tree gum slapped over her eyes, and uh, and was taken by by a large hairy hominid, and uh, which ended up, uh, she ended up siring a child with, and she begged them to go back, and and the 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 infant died, didn't survive. Um, but she said that she was fed well and had eaten roots, fish, and meat during her during her uh, capture. So, I think that uh, I think that when you really get down to it, abduction reports from uh, from Sasquatch, Yeti, etc., are difficult to find. And it's even more difficult to find credible reports of that nature. I mean, there are plenty of people who tell you that the Seraphine Long story, which is sort of the grandmother of all these stories about Sasquatch abduction, um, <clears throat> not to be, Albert, Os- Albert Osman is a, is, a, is a famous case as well. Yeah. But uh, e- even those are sort of viewed with suspicion by a lot of Bigfoot researchers. Well, the thing you just said, too, is that they rubbed, what did they rub on her eyes? Uh, tree gum, which, which again, we're, we, if we're looking at parallels between these phenomena, um, you know, that was one of the things that whenever you went to fairyland, they had to rub some ointment on your eyes so that you could actually see, you know, the fairy realm. It's a very common motif as well. Yeah, so, I mean, there, there's a connection right there, and uh, you found a little bit of that in the, the alien abduction literature as well, right? Yeah, there's this peculiar... Um, Peculiar tendency for uh, ointment uh, to appear in a lot of abduction stories. Um, su- surprisingly enough, there is this um, there is this uh, disturbing trend of men who are abducted um, in Brazil and rubbed down with some sort of ointment and forced to have uh, forced to have sex with an alien. <laughs> I found like five or six <laughs> cases. Five or six cases clustered around that. The most famous one is the uh, the Villa Boas right. <coughs> uh, case. But um, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting because that sort of the ointment thing in general is one of the reasons that I tend to askew uh, hard numbers in this book because the categorization proves to be quite difficult. I think that if you look at things being ingested or substances being provided to produce an effect. Um, it's it's hard to separate ointments out from food in a lot of ways, and that's further compounded by a lot of fascinating research that that says that uh, a lot of people seem to think that aliens tend to ingest through their skin, which is a mm. crazy. Well, it's not not a crazy claim, but it's it's a very um, <clears throat> outrageous claim in a lot of ways. Um, David Jacobs calls this the absorption theory, and so if there is this tendency for uh, these entities, whatever they may be, uh, to consume through their skin, uh, which is also, as a sidebar, one of the ways that people said fairies consume their foison was through their skin. <clears throat> um, if there is some basis to this, it would follow that perhaps the ointments being given to abduct- uh, abductees are also some form of, of food in, of, in and of themselves. So, as always with this sort of phenomenon, it tends to muddy the waters and make things a little bit uh, a little bit more confusing than it feels like they should be. <clears throat> but uh, that's definitely that's definitely something that I go into in the book is trying to unravel that that tightly twisted knot of where ointment and absorption fit in, and and this this idea of putting you know some sort of uh, salve or balm on the eyes to let you uh, transfer yourself into a new realm. Uh, it's all it's all just this one big <laughs> big tightly I, I've thought of it a lot of times as a, a rubber band ball. <laughs> all right, all right. We're gonna take a quick break, we'll be right back. Where did the road go can be heard first and usually live on WVBR Saturday nights at eleven PM Eastern. Go to where did the road go.com to ask questions of our live guests through the chat room. Where Did the Road Go is then re-aired on Dark Matter Radio and Deprogrammed Radio. You can download all shows for free on the website, and you can subscribe to us on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, or Vimeo. Additional content can be found on our video channels. You will also find our upcoming schedule, book reviews, blogs, free book downloads, links, and more. We are also on Facebook and Twitter, and if you want to help support the show, there are links to donate to us. 
Everything you need can be found at wheredidtheroadgo.com. And I should also add to that, since uh, it's kind of an old disclaimer, we're also on Intrepid Radio, um, and I think that's on Thursdays now. So, uh, yeah, i got to make some new intros and outros for the show. Some people don't like the intro. They think it's too uh, too cheesy. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Some people really like it. I, I, I get really mixed feedback. I'm kind of on the fence myself. So uh, now, here's the thing about your intro that a lot of people need to need to be hip to is that it's it's quick. Yes, you know, well, that, some, that was intentional. <laughs> some shows you listen to, it's just like a, a two and a half minute intro, and nobody's, you know, <laughs> people are <laughs> people are listening to that. Maybe you're buying yourself some time, but everybody's going to fast forward through that, right? So, Especially once you've heard it once or twice, you're just kind of like, okay, <laughs> exactly, exactly. My my goal is to get into the the actual meat of the conversation as quick as possible. Yeah, well, yeah, that's that's the way I like it too. So. Um, now, one of the things I was going to bring up a little bit earlier, and we went off in a different direction, is uh, when we were talking about uh, Joe Sim- – how do you say his last name? Uh, Simonton. Simonton. Okay. Mm-hmm. I always think it's like Simitoin or something like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's deceptively simple. <laughs> um, is uh, the similarity between that and, like, the airships of the late 1800s, where you had a similar sort of thing going on where these airships would show up and ask for things like water or various types of food. You know, it's interesting. I, I feel like a lot of uh, what I'm interested in are the are the minutia that 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 happens in these cases, and I think we overlook a lot of things. And one of those things that we tend to overlook are demographics. You know, and I, I don't necessarily mean in terms of oh, this person has Cherokee ancestry and and Irish ancestry, so they're more likely to be abducted. I mean more along the lines of well, people, a lot of these people who had these experiences are farmers, and a lot of the people who had those airship experiences uh, were farmers. Um, but another reason that the uh, the airship cases come to mind is a lot of the people in those airship cases uh, looked very human. Uh, Simonton said that uh, the entities looked like uh, dark-skinned Italians. He didn't really say that they looked like, you know, little green men. Um, but also uh, this idea of uh, giving food to the entities, which happens in a lot of those airship reports. Uh, you know where where they would actually <laughs> land their airship, or you know someone would shimmy down a rope and ask for a pail of milk or something ridiculous like that, um, which is in direct parallel to what Simonton experienced, where it seemed that they were asking, they were you know offering or asking him for water. Uh, it's interesting. Every time that he told the story, it seemed like them them giving him the pancakes was almost more of an afterthought. Uh, took a back seat to to them actually needing something themselves. So yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of parallels there between the descriptions of the entities and the exchange itself and uh, and the per- the people who saw it. Right, right, and it it adds some credibility to the airship cases, which are also kind of uh, a lot of people dismiss them and say, well, you know, there was a lot of. Uh, Newspaper nonsense trying to, you know, outbeat each other for extraordinary headlines and stuff. But when you see this type of stuff in those cases, it suggests that maybe some of these really did happen. Yeah, I think it's I think it's like so much that we experience or that we that we hear about in this in this field, these fields, is that there were probably a nice solid core of things that happened and then it just got out of control and metastasized into something different, a pop culture thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, well yeah. You know, I think I think that can be said with for a lot of the contactees. I think they really did have something uh, objectively weird happen to them, but then they sort of got wrapped up in their own cult of personality and felt like they had to keep on producing results. Yeah, yeah, and I would agree with that. Now, t- talk about the difference between the contactees versus the abductions as far as the food is concerned. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. So anyone who isn't com- entirely familiar, the, the brief thumbnail sketch is that uh, abductions are involuntary, um, uh, and more common to the modern era and unpleasant and contact experiences are more common to yesteryear, uh, like the fifties and sixties, et cetera. Um, voluntary and quite pleasant. And it's interesting that the food in these cases roughly, uh, falls down along these lines. Um, in abductions, foods are often, uh, either force fed or consumed under great duress. In contactee cases, it's usually a very voluntary uh, acceptance of food, and oftentimes they're like, "Oh, this will, this wonderful raspberry juice will make you immortal, or will raise your consciousness, or something, <laughs> something vague <laughs> like that." Whereas, you know, today's grays are like, "Here, I'm gonna shove you this this tube down your throat and just pump your stomach full of something, and we're not even gonna tell you what it's for." Um, 
but you know, it's the 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 taste profiles almost always in these content cases. It was a fruit juice, or it was some sort of special fruit, or some sort of special vegetable, and these would often be accompanied by uh, messages that were pro vegetarian, pro vegan. Um, <clears throat> uh, and in modern cases, uh, these these foods and drinks are often either bitter or uh, or uh, cloyingly sweet, so still an unpleasant experience to consume. Um, Liquids are by far the most common thing that you run into in fairy and alien cases. Um, uh, and after, you know, it's, it, it depends. Um, a lot of the more contacty like cases will involve bread or fruits and vegetables. Um, a lot of the abduction cases, it's it really fits with that medical pageantry. People are either given uh, a drink or an injection or a pill of some sort. Right, right. And pills figure in a lot of this, and you even speculate that some of the small loaves of bread that pe that people got from fairies may have actually been pills. Right, right. Or I mean, you know, uh, to, to be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure that a lot of the uh, the pills that people receive from aliens aren't loaves of bread from fairies. Right. <laughs> small loaves of bread from fairies. I'm, I try to stay as agnostic about this as I can. Um, but yeah, I, 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 there's a lot of confusion um, between. Uh, language in terms of well in terms of existence but in terms of in terms of the way that people describe these things you know uh oftentimes these pills will be either white or multicolored um and i ran into some cases where people said that they were given multicolored eggs and uh, a lot of these pills are accompanied by a drink and in this particular case the eggs were accompanied by a drink so i say mm -hmm. well maybe maybe the eggs were actually uh, pills in some way um yeah, yeah. P pills are one of those one of those particular foods that really opens up a lot more questions and answers, even more so than usual, because there is this sort of uh, fast and loose way with which we describe pills. You know, pills, tablets. You know, it, it's it's always this sort of you know what well, they could be multiple shapes, multiple sizes, and we would still call it a pill or a tablet. So a lot of times, fairies would give these tiny little fairy loaves that were about the size of a walnut or an acorn. Uh, and I think that there's 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 some similarity in some of the uh, the ways that those are presented, and some of the ways that alien abduction uh, tends to present these pills to to abductees. You, you also mentioned at some point, and I forget exactly what you said, but you were talking about like the perception of color and the way language affects it. Like some languages don't have words for certain colors, and right, yeah, that, that's that's one of those one of those reasons that. Uh, <sighs> <laughs> that I again that I tried to avoid a lot of a lot of concrete uh, concrete descriptors. I mean, I, I obviously in terms of like you know saying well this percentage of foods are this color and this percentage of foods are this color, um, because you know in in some in some languages. Um, in old Irish, uh, gloss could be green or gray. Um, modern Persian lacks a distinction between black, blue, and green. Um, and also, you know, it's when you factor when you take that, and you also factor in other other confounding factors like uh, some of these foods tend to change colors. Um, some of these foods aren't recalled as having colors, especially if it's done under you know hypnotic regression or something. Um, some people are colorblind. I feel like it, I feel like that's something that we can't really rely on as solidly as we'd like to. Um, not the line, language has its pro own problems anyway. I right, think. right. I, yeah. Um, but but I wonder when you talk about like Persian having the same word for different colors, do the people make the distinction between the colors, or do they literally look the same to them based on the the culture they've been raised in? And because I've always wondered, you know, like what I see is green. Is that the same green you see, or do you see yellow, or do you see red? You know what I would consider to be red. You know what I'm saying? Right. No, there's a lot of old, and this is this is something that you you probably find super fascinating. There's a lot of old, um, old uh, records of explorers who encounter certain tribes. Um, I can't think of any any exact examples, but I've read several of these where uh, certain tribes just didn't have these words. They didn't have a way to just differentiate that the sky was blue. You know, they just call it a different color until you know the the culture moves in and 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 sort of that 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 idea becomes ingrained in there. Um, I think actually this, you know, you know, I were talking about different podcasts. I think actually Mysterious Universe brought this up back when the uh, the the Twitter dress was all the rage, where people right, were right. arguing over whether it's black or blue. Um, you know, uh, 
this is something that Terrence McKenna talked about a lot is this this idea of how language is sort of this virus and we're we're sort of uh, our entire reality is formed by language and and there's not really a good way to to <laughs> it's kind of a, when you get down to it it's a poor way to transmit ideas you know it's it's relatively slow um <laughs> and it and it it's it, there's a lot of room for uh, for ambiguity in it um and that yeah and that dress thing uh, a lot of people laughed it off but i thought it was a brilliant example about how our perceptions are so easily fooled and they're not as concrete as we think they are. It is. It was one, you know, it's, I agree with you. It's, it was one of the most important object lessons to Fortiana in the past five years, in my opinion, because it's an easy way to get the, the man on the street to, to, to understand a lot of these higher concepts that we tend to t- to talk about in terms of perception, in terms of, of, uh, of, Things not always being as objective as they appear. So yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, it's it's it sounds kind of trite, but I, I'll probably keep on trotting that one out for another couple of years. <laughs> and and I was convinced at first that it was it was like a uh, an animated GIF or something, you know that, oh. that they had found a way to make an animated JPEG and it was just changing and oscillating. I, yeah, and <laughs> I and I had actually downloaded it onto my computer, checked it out, and I'm like, nope, that's just an image. And I kept seeing one color, and I was like. I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand what people are seeing. And I walked out of the room and I came back and it was a different color. And I went, son of a. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Like, I, I feel like there, I feel like there were uh, hordes of graphic designers and art artists who were yelling at us that, no, it's, can't you tell what color it is? Because <laughs> if you know, the, if you know the circumstances around that photo and the way that it's, you know, if, if, if you infer that it's lit a certain way, it's, you can definitely sort of, uh, for me, I'm, I'm sort of able to, to, shift my perception back and forth between the two depending on the way I look at it but it was it was I think like I said I think it was one of the most important object lessons yeah. that could have happened for for us for as a community <clears throat> and and I think too you know the moment I I was in a room with a bunch of people and everyone was looking at the same picture and seeing a different color I was like okay it's not a trick there's it's, yeah. it's messing with our perception yeah yeah it was fascinating but it shows how easily our perception can be fooled how it's not anywhere near as concrete as everyone seems to think it is i mean that's why you know when you get like witness reports and you know of something mundane and all five witnesses give you a slightly different version of the story the only time yeah. the only Sorry, time to be, to be suspicious is when you're getting the exact same story from everyone <laughs> exactly exactly you know it's as long as these motifs are in place the the more bizarre the more likely to me it sometimes seems that it will be you know uh, one of my favorite uh one of my favorite uh uh, people who talk about this sort of idea uh, is is Greg Bishop, who has a great program called Ra- Radio Mysterioso, um, and uh, Greg often talks about this idea of of co creation. How much are we bringing to the experience? Um, which I think is a great idea, and I think that it's 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 an integral part of of these these uh, encounters. What's interesting to me is that uh, I feel like in this particular area, this idea of food doesn't seem like there's a lot of co-creation because you have all these cases from the western world the western world that values meat the western world that values candy and meat and candy just don't show up in these cases like hardly ever at all it's 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 bizarre um so i think you know co-creation might have something to do with with the uh these experiences on on the macro level there's there's definitely some sort of consistent through line that runs through a lot of these cases on on some of the details. And, and what do you and you speculate a bit on what the purpose of the food serves? Right, you know it, it's it's interesting. Um, uh, similarly to the way that smells can be very immediately evocative of something for us, food can be the same way. You know, I know my my mom, for example. Uh, uh, can't eat conch anymore. She had some conch in the Bahamas one time, and it was, it was she got food poisoning. And she used to love conch, but ever since then, she can't eat it anymore. It turns her stomach. Um, so there's this idea that uh, that perhaps uh, you know, as, as I said, language is a poor way of communicating. You know, if I think we can all, you know, I think a lot of people have one form of alcohol that they got sick on and will never touch again. <laughs> so if I wanted to make you sick, wouldn't that be a great way to make you sick? So the idea is, is, is perhaps there are certain emotions attached to certain, uh, in this case, foods, and they're designed to elicit uh, an emotion. On the other hand, um, we expect things that we eat to affect us in some way. You know, everything you eat, 
you know, whether it be a bite of a candy bar or a bite of a salad is going to affect you. You're going to have to, to pass it at some point. It's, you know, this chocolate's going to make you fat. This wine's going to make you drunk. We all expect something that we put into our bodies to have some sort of effect. And given some of the trends that I noticed where, the, where these, these foods tend to either come at the beginning or most commonly at the end of these encounters, if perhaps this uh, isn't some sort of simulacra, some sort of food mirage to actually trigger a shift in consciousness in the mind of the observer. One could almost think of it as a, a, a post-ordinary life suggestion, as opposed to a post-hypnotic suggestion, to return you back to your, to your mortal world. Um, mm. And that's sort of a thumbnail sketch of what I get, I get into. I, 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 there are a lot of different facets to explore in that, but I, I think it's partially a means of communication. It's partially a means of, of facilitating a change in the witness. So the, one of the other things you talk about is uh, the incident of food in dreams and uh, a similar role sometimes it plays there. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because um, I, I found some research that suggested that uh, food consumed in your dreams could actually have some sort of uh, effect on, on yourselves or food consumed in uh, uh, psychedelic states, DMT trips, can actually have some sort of effect on consciousness. There's a great account that I found where uh, a person uh, claimed to have uh, had their longest DMT trip because halfway through it they took another hit of DMT in the, basically <laughs> in, 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 in the trip. So this idea that, uh, that the, the means to prompt us in and out of these states is a lot more about just getting your mind to accept it as opposed to actually having some sort of physical uh, you know, stimulus is something that that I definitely can can uh, can examine. You know, uh, there's a lucid dream researcher by the name of Robert Wagoner who talked to a Dutch man who had given up uh, marijuana and g completely sober, and he had was having a dream uh, where he was he started practice practicing lucid dreaming, and he actually had a dream where he was on an airline and he uh, was offered. Uh, uh, a joint by the stewardess and he decided well I'm, I'm, I'm dreaming he realized at this point that he was dreaming and he says this isn't me breaking any sort of vow that I have to myself so I'm gonna I'm gonna light up and uh, he had a high in his dream and he woke up and he said that he still had the high now of course it's anecdotal but um, it's really it's really fascinating to me this idea that that uh, food can be consumed in the dream state or any sort of consumable can be consumed in the dream state and have an effect on someone. Uh, this is also tied into uh, the concept of Ogun Oru, which was uh, the Yoruba term, West African Yoruba term for sleep paralysis, which again, we all know is tied into this whole bucket of worms, um, you know, with alien abduction and the old hag syndrome. But uh, right. in, in that particular African culture, Ogun Oru is sleep paralysis that a, uh, a spirit gives you when you eat food in a dream. And they then they have some sort of uh, entry point to... Uh, <laughs> a Trojan feast, if you will, um, an entry point into your consciousness to actually sort of take over your life um, and, and, and cause horrible things to happen to you. So, uh, yeah, th there's this idea yeah. that food – the reason that that's really germane to our discussion is because uh, if, if these beings don't necessarily consume in traditional ways, which Foison says that they don't and uh, the, this idea of the absorption theory says that they don't, then that me makes it less likely that they're giving actual food. And if we can say that, well, simulacra, mirages of food, can have some sort of effect, then perhaps that's actually what they're doing. That's, that's the main goal. Now, salt, you, you mentioned, is often absent in these things, except for a few rare examples. And it seems like they have an aversion to salt, which is uh, something you hear a lot in folklore. It's in occult lore and so on and so forth. Uh, what do you make of that? Yeah, iron and salt were two of the the uh, best uh, prophylactics for, uh, to use against fairies. Um, and lots of times you will not find uh, you will not find salt in these cases at all. Uh, in fact, some cases it would it was very d explicitly described as saltless food. Um, what's What's interesting to me is that there's also some uh, some research to suggest that sleep paralysis, returning to that theme is brought on by an imbalance of electrolytes. So perhaps this idea of salt keeping the entities away is uh, somehow uh, tied into that. Uh, more prosaic, more well, more prosaically, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of folklorists will tell you that uh, salt prevents against decay. Salt is a preservative. So therefore, if 
the fairies are associated with the dead, then salt keeps off decay. It keeps off, keeps away the dead. That's, that's the line of logic there. But, um, salt is definitely one of those things that in a lot of cultures, um, around the globe has some sort of special, uh, uh, property to keep uh, entities away. And we're talking here with Joshua Cutchin about his book, A Trojan Feast. We're going to go a few more minutes here um, because we haven't gotten to the, the point uh, near the end of the book here where you, you throw out kind of your theory on what's going on. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's it's tentative and it, it, it owes a lot of um, owes, owes a great debt to a lot of a lot of minds that have come before me. But I, I posit that uh, that you know, if if these entities are not consuming a traditional fashion, they're not offering traditional earthly food. Um, even if you're a, subs- a subscriber to the extraterrestrial hypothesis, it's highly unlikely that a gray alien would have food that's compatible with our biology. Um, uh, so if if they if they don't consume the way that we are, then that means that they likely don't uh, have the same things that we eat on hand, which means that they're perhaps giving some sort of uh, some sort of uh, mirage some, to us, some sort of food mirage. Um, this, when coupled with uh, a lot of a lot of ideas uh, around, and sort the book sort of goes into entheogens and this idea of of eating the god, that uh, by consuming certain entities, you can actually gain the powers of said entity. So if I'm, I'm starting to ramble, I'm sorry. I'm trying, <laughs> I've got so many things flying around in my head. Um, <laughs> well, it's it's, so, it's a hard thing to just wrap up in a couple of words. I mean, so I think you need to ramble a little to kind of tie it up correctly. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, as, as I t- as I found out very early on, there's no elevator pitch for this for this project. <laughs> um, uh, b- basically, if if these entities are able to interact with us as as I personally feel. Uh, through altered states of consciousness and altered brain chemistry, such as dimethyltryptamine, um, then they, in a sense, are inhabiting this uh, liminal zone between the objective and the subjective. And everything that they appear to be is part of the same medium. So, you know, if if, if they are appearing to us through using a DMT as a communicator, then uh, their clothes are part of the same medium. Their spaceship is part of the same medium. They're all sort of the same medium to us, in which case the food that they offer would be the same medium. So they're symbolically offering a piece of themselves, the eating of the God, which, uh, which in a lot of cultures um, can bestow the abilities of the God unto the, to the consumer, um, is perhaps a way that they use to facilitate changes in our a particular consciousness to either uh, begin, prolong, or end an encounter, depending on depending on uh, on on what they see fit. True, true. Is and, is that okay? Yeah, <laughs> is, is yeah. That clear, no, that, 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 okay. <laughs> I think you did a good job trying to clarify <laughs> that as easy as thanks. you could. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because it, there's a lot there's a lot in the books. Actually, the longest chapter is on is on entheogens, yes. um, and uh, because I, I feel like that is something you know, all these traditions say that these uh, substances, these ayahuasca and, and a lot of other other entheogens, are actually given to us by the gods. So in some sense, they are a version of this food that we can study and we can see the effect that it has on the human body. And you have people who go under ayahuasca. Graham Hancock was one of them. He went under ayahuasca in some 2013 sessions and was actually uh, given, uh, offered food by entities. So there's, there's, this, there's this other connection there which, which I sort of tease out and which leads me to that point. So uh, it's, 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 a, it's a circuitous road and it makes a lot more sense if you walk it as opposed to me dropping you off right, right, at the right. destination. <laughs> the... Uh... But but it it makes a lot of sense that, that you know I mean when you look at it as a sort of demonic reality model where you yeah. have this this liminal in between state it makes sense that they would try and give us something to maybe make that connection stronger. Um, it seems to me like sometimes they're more here than there, and sometimes we're more there than here. I would think so. You know, and, and I, I think that. I think that you know again the monkey wrench, which uh, I actually ended up I actually ended up quoting you in the book, sir. I, uh, <laughs> I um, about about how you know you can't always have have hard and fast rules about these things because even though this is a pretty common I would call it a minor motif amongst a lot of alien cases, abduction cases, and whatnot, um, there are 
the five times as many cases that don't feature food at all or right, drink at all. Right. So uh, I, I guess maybe it's sort of a different strokes for different folks approach, perhaps. Uh, you know, f- food would probably work for me pretty well. I'm a big guy. I like to eat. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so, you know, ma- when you see it more in the fairy faith, too, food was more a part of that culture back in the 1800s because everyone was farming. I mean, food was not, it's not like today where you can just go to the grocery store and pick up food. Food was a very important relevant part of life and you know so it makes sense that that would connect with the phenomena more than it does today oh absolutely i mean one of the most famous stories jimmy doyle in the fairy palace um features a drunk who's offered fairy punch and doesn't drink it so the idea is well, you know and a lot of these people you know fairy struck was a term for be- for becoming home drunk as well as a term for fairies literally putting you into a state of of paralysis so you know perhaps uh, you know, uh, this phenomena tends to pick on the marginalized because it knows that the marginalized will not be believed. You know, I think that there's a lot of different angles to tease out from this, and and again, it opens up more questions than answers. And anyone who who disagrees with my conclusions, I'm not married to this at all. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would I would love for for uh, there to be. Uh, uh, nuts and bolts craft that lands on the White House lawn tomorrow. <laughs> because it would, even though it would mean I wouldn't sell another book, <laughs> and this entire book was you know was was worthless. It would be a, it would be a point of validation. So it's you know it's 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 a thought experiment, and it goes to some some far out places. But I think that there's, I think at the end of the day, there's some grain of truth in here somewhere. I agree. So. I think I think your your work here is phenomenal. It's a fascinating read. How long did it take you to put this together from start to finish? Uh, a year, basically. That's it, uh, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I uh, did the did the hardcore research for about uh, four months, and then I wrote for another probably five months and then a couple more months I was uh, editing it and shopping it around. Uh, Red Pill Junkie uh, did a pass on it and Micah Hanks did a pass on it and I got some good feedback from those gentlemen. So Nice, nice. Uh, it's, a very, very, it's a pleasure to know them. All right. Um, is, there, is there anything about this we haven't covered that you think uh, is important here? That's a pretty good, uh, pretty good whirlwind tour, I, th- I think. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of folklore in the book, and there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, cases that I think are strong, and a lot of cases that I think are dubious. But uh, the trends still tend to bear themselves out. So, at the very least, uh, we we have a better idea of what to expect in cases. True, true. And when you can predict what people are going to be fed when they go into a boulder. <laughs> And the the book again is A Trojan Feast, the food and drink offerings of aliens, fairies, and Sasquatch. Yes, Out thank on you. An anomalous books. And you are Joshua Cutchin, and that's C U T C H I N. You want to give people your website as well? Absolutely. You can find uh, my it's sort of the hub for everything me, which is something narcissistic that I'm not really keen on, but um, <laughs> it's the hub for everything me. Uh, keep keep abreast of, of what I'm doing in terms of uh, in terms of interviews, and I'm also a musician, so I keep my my music and my uh, my uh, my performances up there as well, as well as some unique blog posts. Um, it's joshuacutchin.com, J O S H U A C U T C H I N dot com, and that's sort of the hub for everything about me and. Uh, I should be coming out with something soon about my upcoming next project. So I was just going to ask you about that. You don't want to give that one away yet. I'm being a little bit coy. I'll probably come out with it at some point. It's 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 if if people liked a Trojan Feast, I think that they'll like this because it's a very similar approach to saying, "Hey, look, everybody's describing this. Why aren't they not talking about this?" So I'll, I'll I'll say something in the in the coming months probably about it. All right, and we'll have you back for our midweek podcast series. Yeah, I'm um, looking forward to it. So, uh, yeah, and that should be very, very soon. Next one I think we're going to do is part two of the whole evidence thing. And like I said, I I want to bring in science as well and kind of look at the other side of the coin. Uh, If you didn't hear the first one, it was on last week, uh, wheredidtheroadgo.com. Of course, you can download every show we've ever done, and uh, you can watch all the videos and everything. Everything is there. It's all free. So uh, go check it out. And thank you, Joshua. This is a great piece of work. Oh, th- thanks so much, Soraya. It's 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 a real pleasure. You know, I was listening to Where Did the Road Go uh, all throughout the, uh, the this process, and it's it's a great program, and it's it's truly an honor to be to be part of this. Oh, thank you, and I'm I'm glad we finally got John. Me as well. <laughs> all right.